Hello everyone. Welcome to week number eight. This is our last week together in Science 200. And it's a big one because you wrap up your whole research project that you've been doing this term by making a presentation. So let's see what's going on. <clears throat> so last week you worked on your speaker's notes which are what you would say when you're giving a presentation. So you had to get your presentation organized to start with, and then you would write out, hopefully you wrote out, what you were going to say in this presentation that you're giving because you have done all this research on that particular topic um, for your presentation for this term. Um, so I'll be grading the speaker's notes. Hopefully you won't have any revisions, but if you do, make those before you put them onto your slides. If you're making a Prezi presentation, you're just going to have to submit a Word document. But if you're doing PowerPoint, you take those chunks of the speaker's notes and put them at the bottom of the slide. So all I have to do is look at the slide and then read the speaker's notes right below that. So that's the speaker's notes, and we're going to talk about your presentation in just a minute. Um, I did want to mention to you some things that I noticed as I was going through the discussion board for week six. Um, so the discussion board for week, week six was, what did you learn that was surprising about your particular topic? So what I did, I, I'm teaching two sections of Science 200, so... I compiled all that information from all those discussion board postings and I just wanted to review real quickly what I saw that you had learned about these different topics. Now I haven't covered all of them here, but these were the major ones that people chose and so I went with these. <clears throat> so GMOs, there's a lot of controversy about GMOs. Everybody in the world has heard of GMOs. I bet you bought non-GMO food, right? Whatever that is these days, because, you know, yeah, all corn, all soybeans are GMOs, genetically modified organisms. And they've been modified in certain ways. They aren't modified into frankenfoods that are gigantic or radioactive or something. They're very specific genes that are added to these, usually plants, but some animals, and some bacteria, but anyway, um, so genes are added to plants to make them pesticide resistant so that farmers can use Roundup on their crops to kill weeds and that makes the actual crop plants grow better, um, give them disease resistance, give them nutritional value, help make the produce last longer, especially, longer, especially farm to market. For example, tomatoes, you know, tomatoes are very soft. And so as soon as they're picked, you're going to have trouble with getting them to the market and then having good quality tomatoes in the grocery store for everyone to buy. So there are different genes that are added to GMOs, depending on what the crop is and what the need is and what the call for it is. You know, the market drives everything. <clears throat> so a couple of things that I noticed was that most students who did this project wanted to look at how harmful GMOs are to our health. And guess what you didn't find? A bunch of studies that say that genetically modified organisms are harmful to us. Um, some of you wanted to answer the question, can GMOs cause cancer? Okay, you have to think about this. Can you imagine how long that study would have to be? Because when do you usually develop cancer? When you're older. How long have GMOs been around? Only since the 1990s, that's when the very first ones were produced. So this type of study would have to be tremendously long. Now you can do much shorter studies if you're doing animal studies, and that's what I suggested to a lot of you, to take a look at animal studies, especially like mice. Mice have a two-year lifespan, so you know you can do one of these studies in two years using mice. But I think overall what you found was that there are not many documented cases of changes in human health or animal health because of consuming genetically modified organisms. And there's a good reason for that because there literally is one gene that is different in a corn plant for a GMO compared to 
a typical corn plant that farmers used to grow. You know, there's, there's very little difference in the two. <clears throat> now, sometimes they may cause allergens, but then somebody, and I can't remember who it is, so I apologize for that. Somebody said, maybe you could take out the allergens by genetically modifying an organism. What a great idea that is for something like peanuts. So anyway, you found that there weren't quite as many health risks as you thought there would be when you started studying this topic. Those of you who worked on electric vehicles, a lot of you concentrated on, are these really beneficial to the environment? Are they as green as everybody says they are? And what about the power supplies that are required to run electric vehicles? vehicles because you have to plug them in you have to plug them in everywhere so that power is coming from somewhere and some of you found that there are coal burning power plants that are generating electricity that are used used by electric vehicles to run so is that lower in their carbon footprint at all because in the end the burning of fossil fuels is what's running the electric vehicles. So, yeah, we had some issues with these electric vehicles. Maybe they're not quite as green as everybody is saying that they are. Biodiversity con conservation, I believe a lot of you have found that <clears throat> habitat destruction is one predominant reason for the loss of biodiversity in different ecosystems. The community of organisms living in an ecosystem has to be diverse because every little organism has its own place, it has its own place in the food web, has its own place in recycling nutrients, etc. And so you have to have a very diverse set of organisms that li live in an ecosystem. Um, Biodiversity conservation is very important because it keeps the biodiversity in an ecosystem. But we are destroying, especially we as human beings, are destroying ecosystems left and right, especially with habitat destruction like deforestation of the Amazonian rainforest. Um, but also climate change is uh, doing harm to biodiversity also. So there's several reasons for this. Can we reverse this? Yes, we certainly can. We have to pay attention to what we're doing. We can't just mow down every tree. Uh, this is especially true in South Carolina. I tell you, when we put up a new subdivision, you just cut down every plant, every tree, down to the bare ground, and then build some houses that look exactly like each other, and maybe plant a new little stick in the front yard as the tree for that house. It's just unbelievable. Um, <clears throat> that is not the way to conserve biodiversity anywhere. So we have to be mindful of that, pay attention to it, um, take measures to preserve our biodiversity wherever it is that we live. Ocean acidification, some of you looked at that and how harmful it is to marine life, and it really is even at the level that it's at right now, and we expect it to get worse. So the ocean is becoming more and more acidic. This is ruining coral reefs. This is damaging marine life, especially um, the newly hatched eggs <clears throat> of all different types of marine life. Um, it keeps the exoskeletons from arthropods from um, being produced. It causes all kinds of very bad effects and one of the most important human food supplies in the world is marine life fish and shellfish so we've got to figure out a way to reverse ocean acidification and that is coming about because of climate change and the burning of fossil fuels and then some of you looked at genetic engineering remember i said i'm not covering every single topic but these are the main ones Genetic engineering, and a lot of you who looked at this realized that there are many ethical issues that come with this. Right now, there is a ban on changing the DNA in human embryos or even fertilized eggs, which are called zygotes. Um, 
there's a ban on this. And that's because who is going to decide which genes get changed in a new human? Um, who's going to decide and which genes will we be able to change? Now, will we in the future be able to eliminate disease genes? I believe that we will. It is not here yet because the ethics, hello, the ethics um, <clears throat> questions that are raised have not been determined yet. We have not figured this out yet. So that was another interesting thing that y'all ran across. Okay, let's get on to the next slide and what we've got going on this week. So you got discussion board postings for this last week. What were your challenges with presenting your information to the audience that you chose? And were your sources helpful in helping you present your information in that way to that audience? Then for your two response posts, the initial post is due by Thursday night. The other response posts, the two response posts are due by Sunday night. And what are the similarities and differences in your experience in shaping your presentation to that particular audience with your classmates? Do you have similarities? Do you have differences? What about your audiences? Because some of you are giving your presentations to experts and some of you are giving your presentations to high school students. So big difference in your audiences. <clears throat> what are the similarities and differences that you have? You're going to complete the exercises in Chapter 8 on the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, and you're going to read another uh, peer-reviewed article about this work, and there are lots of statistics and great statistics in this particular article. It is amazing at how much damage that particular oil spill did in the Gulf of Mexico. So finish that up. <clears throat> and then you've got final presentations. And that is in the form of slides. This is not just a written document. These are slides that you have to put together with your speaker's notes, because you already wrote your speaker's notes this past week. Include graphics, include data, include imagery. Imagery is terribly important. If you just throw up on the screen a slide of a whole bunch of words, your audience is going to go to sleep within the first 10 seconds of your presentation. You've got to make a powerful impact with your graphics. <clears throat> you don't need a whole lot of words on the screen. Remember, you've got the speaker's notes to go by to help you present the information to your audience. <clears throat> so if you want to put some a few, a few bullet points on your slide, that's great. You shouldn't have everything all written out that you're going to say that because everybody else can read too. If you're going to read what's on the slide, there is no point in you even standing there because your audience can read as well as you can. So make slides, five to seven slides. I'd say it's, you know, because you've got to have one opening slide. So that's one. That only leaves you six more. So I don't know. Somewhere around five to seven. If you go over, don't worry about that. Include your references, too. Don't forget that. That's not counted as one of your slides, though. <clears throat> so make them interesting. Make them impactful for your particular audience. So use imagery. That's very important. So that is due along with the speaker's notes, and that's the last thing that you have due for this term. Final thoughts and tasks. Please do your course evaluations. They help me. So if you do your course evaluation, you know, tell me what I did that was right. Tell me if I need to improve on anything. Um, these also help tell my dean and my team leader how I did in my job this term. So that they are very helpful to me and to the administration at SNHU. So please do those. And... A reminder, the last day to turn in any work for the course is Sunday, April the 23rd at 11.59 p.m. If you try to upload anything after that, you cannot unless we have turned in an incomplete request form and had it approved before that time. And if 
you get an incomplete that is approved for you to work for an extra month, then the course is still open to you. However, if you ask for an incomplete, you have to have successfully completed 70% of the coursework. And they ask me that. And if you haven't, they will turn it down. So I'm just saying, you have to have done 70% of the coursework successfully in order to even request an incomplete for an extra month's um, time to work on your coursework. So um, that's something else to consider, especially if you're having an issue right here at the very end. Um, if you are having any trouble, please let me know before the end of the term. Please, 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 please. I really need to know ahead of time. Okay? I wish you all the best. I'll be sending out an email message after I've turned in grades and that sort of thing. But I wish you all the best. And please keep in touch. I love to, excuse me, to hear, oh no, I've got hiccups. I love to hear from my, from my former students. So please. Please keep in touch with me, m.sigmund at snhu.edu. I'll be glad to keep in touch with you. Send out a re excuse me, I've got hiccups. Reference letter for you. With that being said, I hope that you have a wonderful last week. Bye.